right. All right. Well, hello again to our Chiral community. I'm Honey Sigari, founder and CEO of Chiral. And today I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Sanibar Doctor, better known as Dr. Doctor. Dr. Doctor is a dual board certified dermatologist with extensive experience in anti-aging and hair loss. My favorite topic. She's the leading expert in integrative and holistic dermatology and has multiple national and international awards, scholarships, research studies, and recognized for novel therapies. What makes Dr. Doctor even more special is her medical approach. She is proactive, compassionate, and understands the mind-body spiritual wellness. Her ultimate goal is to help everyone be the healthiest, best version of themselves. Dr. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's dive deep in. Let, tell me a little bit more about your holistic approach of integrating the bo body-mind connection. Yeah, sure. Um, it is something that I'm very passionate about and I keep advocating as well. Because my journey from conventional medicine towards this came into being when I realized that we were treating the symptoms um, at the surface level, and there is so much more that needs to be done. Otherwise, those conditions or symptoms will keep recurring again and again. So we need to bring an end to that cycle is that is where you not only take care of any skin condition or anything for that matter, um, just thinking in dimension of that one organ, but taking all the other things into play, like your gut health, your mental health, what are all these and how are they going to affect and how do they actually affect to what you are seeing getting manifested on your skin. So that is how we integrate different modalities and take care of it in an entire complete way rather than just taking care of one symptom. And if I could ask you, what brought you to dermatology and what made you so passionate about it? What excites you about it? Um, quite honestly, I wanted to do surgery. I chanced into dermatology because I got good grades and it was my inquisitiveness towards uh, like skin is the largest organ of our body, right? And it is what we see. But there is so much more that I realized um, after going into dermatology that is included within its realm than what we just see. Like until and unless we don't experience it, something as simple as a drug rash, like we take pop in drugs so commonly, but drug rash is like 90% of the visits that occur in the ER or the clinic is due to a drug rash. And that is something uh, that we see very commonly. There are so many things that came into being right from skin, hair, um, autoimmune diseases. So it is a big, big thing. And uh, yeah, so I just chanced into dermatology, to be honest. I love that you're incorporating that, that there's a spiritual element to it. And there's a mind body connection, because just like you said, skin's the biggest organ in your body, and it just shows all the symptoms of what's going on here and also here, right? Can you give us an example, like maybe take psoriasis or something? Can you give us an example of how the mind affects the skin? Right. Um, there are studies that have now proven and shown that stress is one of the aggravating and the leading uh, factors that can uh, precipitate or aggravate skin conditions like psoriasis, eczema, acne, right? So um, uh, people consider stress as only a stressful event that might be taking place in their lives, but even something as simple as uh, getting worked up if you're late and you have to reach the office. There are these simple little, little things that accumulate that, uh, that sends your body into that overdrive that keeps that adrenaline pumping and it can create a havoc in your hormonal system and that can contribute in some other way. So they're all interconnected in some way or the other, even uh, the kind of relationship that you're in, whether you're happy, you're not. So there are so many little aspects of our everyday life that influence uh, and uh, like it's been proven as well, like uh, a mental uh, conflict can get manifested in a physical form. So yeah, it's definitely connected and there is more recognition coming in now so that people are realizing and taking it into consideration when they are like taking care of it. I love that. With, with all your experience and expertise, can you look at someone's skin and know 
what, what they're going through. If they're going through a hardship, just out of curiosity, can you tell as a doctor and uh, with the experience you have? To be honest, not, like not just looking at the skin, but when I talk to the person, I can get a sense of what's happening. Like if I, that's why my consults are not like short 15 minutes, they're like one hour consults because I, once I speak and get to know the person, I know exactly what I'm dealing with and what I need to do to like get it out completely from them because people are initially hesitant to like like reveal everything that they're going through because at first encounter we are strangers right nobody's going to be vulnerable and share everything but you I think yeah as you said with experience I have that thing now I get to know and that's when I probe them a little further and I'll be like yeah go on you can tell me more about it your secret's safe with me oh my gosh I love that you're doing that I love that um it's it, it, cause I I've noticed, you know, my skin, I've been very stressed lately and I, yeah, my skin feels dry. It feels, my nails feel brittle. I mean, you're right. It's all uh, part of the same process, but let's dive in. And I want to ask you, um, let's start with skincare one-on-one. What are the basic steps of a good skincare routine for all skin types? Mm, I love that question because, uh, um, like with all the social media hype these days and so many things coming in, I think sticking to the basics is the most important and what we forget. So uh, cleansing, moisturizing, and sun protection. These are the three basic things that is universal and true no matter whether you're man or woman, whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter. Because uh, a healthy skin barrier is the basic foundation. Because no matter what else you're going to do, it's not going to manifest if you're not taking care of this basic preliminary step. And it doesn't have to be too complicated. You just need to identify your skin type, understand what it is, and use a very simple uh, regimen or products that suit your skin type. So uh, you cleanse, make sure there are no impurities, but you also want to make sure that you're not stripping off the oils from your face. So you need to take care of that. Then you need to moisturize so that you maintain that healthy skin barrier. You take care of it as well. And sun protection is very important, especially today. Like I believe in healthy sun exposure to get your vitamin D levels and stay healthy. But we have seen the downsides to the damage that ultraviolet rays can cause as well. So sun protection is a muscle. If you do at least these three basic things, you are set on a very nice. So you heard it. But cleanse, moisturize, and protect your skin. And I love it. Those are those are very good recommendations. Now, um, what are some common skincare myths that people should be aware of? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> <laughs> like every day I'm surprised with something new that my patients or clients will tell me and I'll be like, where did you hear that from? <laughs> but uh, uh, simple ones like don't pop a pimple as much as you are tempted to and as much as anyone will show you on YouTube or TikTok or whatever it is, uh, you are going to leave yourself with a scar and pigmentation if you are going to irritate any sort of inflammation. I'm not speaking about um, it's acne, but even if you get a boil, or even if for that matter, uh, dry skin, that each scratch cycle is going to keep, uh, it becomes a vicious cycle and you will keep doing it. So if you feel you're going to get away with it, it's not going to work that way. Mm. So that is one big thing. Another very common thing that I see is when it comes to products, especially more expensive doesn't mean it is better. So uh, you need to know what ingredients are present in the product, whether it is suitable for your skin type and whether it is something that you really need. Um, any other skin myths that you know of? I, I don't know if you follow some of the TikTok trends. I remember one that was like Vaseline. You rub Vaseline all over your face and you sleep with it and you put saran. Oh my gosh, there's so many, but I'm glad you touched on uh, the pimple popping ones. I love those videos. I don't know about anybody else who's watching this right now, but I can watch those for hours with the blackheads and the boils. So don't pop pimples. That's your recommendation. Stay away because you're going to get scars and you're going to get hyperpigmentation. So thank you. Anything else? Any other myths or recommendations? How about chocolate? Chocolate causes acne. Is that a, is that a myth we can debunk? Um, so there is truth. 
to it to some extent because uh, if you're if you're speaking about regular chocolate we know the amount of sugar levels that are present in it which can increase the caloric intake and in turn we know excessive sugar is not good in any form because again that can lead to increased aging there's something called glycation where it can break down collagen so there are many aspects to that uh, side to it but there's also true that dark chocolate is very beneficial there are studies that have proven it so um, I never tell my clients to be very honest to stop eating or indulging in anything that they want to you can as long as you know that you are having it in moderation and you uh, and it's something that your body feels fine having so um, I'm not going to deny that it's not true but uh, it's definitely not something that uh, I can um, like just turn a blind eye to because we have seen uh, dairy, chocolate, or any sort of unhealthy dietary lifestyles aggravating and causing inflammation. So acne essentially is an inflammatory state. So maybe that indirectly helps, but there are papers supporting and negating it. So. <laughs> I, I would love to talk about AGEs and anti, um, you know, anti-aging and so forth. We'll, we'll dive in, but um, let's start with, at, at Cairo, we talk a lot about the cellular turnover cycle and a lot of our products also uh, are incorporated in the cellular turnover cycle. Can you explain to someone who has never heard about what the cellular turnover cycle is? Can you explain what it is? Sure. Um, so this again comes to the basic of what our skin is. So our skin is just not a one single layer that we see it to be. It actually has multiple layers that it is made up of. Um, think of it like a seven to 10 cell layered piece, like a brick and mortar kind of building. Uh, and our skin cells are born at the base of this entire system. And then as they mature, they're going to keep coming up. And uh, when they are like completely mature, they have lived their life, they die. And that's what we call, they, got, they, uh, they leave their nucleus, the keratin level is like to its optimal, and then it shuts off. So normally the skin cycle will take roughly about 28 days to go from the bottom layer to mature and then come up. And then to fall off, it takes another 40 to 28 days. And this cycle continues till the end. And, and how does, um, I know when you're born, this cycle happens rapidly every two weeks, right? You have the cellular turnover cycle, but how does the cycle, uh, how is it affected as you age and get older? I love that because uh, what people tend to forget is skin is just uh, another important vital organ like the rest of our body, right? So uh, as we age, all our organs are going to like, like apart from maybe the heart that continues to beat at its regular rate, everything else is going to take its wear and tear and slow down. So similarly, our skin's ability to cycle how it normally did is going to slow down. And uh, um, its efficiency, if I can say, is going to like slow down or retard as well. So what it normally could do within 28 days, as rapidly and as efficiently it did, it might take its own time, or it might not be able to efficiently remove the dead skin cells is when you need to gently exfoliate or the collagen production that was rapidly taking place when you were young is not going to be as efficient when you're aging. So there are many things that happen within the skin as well, like the rest of the body. That's great. So, so let's dive deep into that. What are some, uh, really great anti-aging ingredients and what can we do to increase the cellular turnover cycle and what are some ingredients that you recommend? When it comes to, uh, so another thing is I don't like the word anti-aging to be honest because we cannot really stop aging. So yeah. when I, um, that's why my, if you see my YouTube channel it's called Healthy Aging with Dr. Doctor because I really believe we have to get in terms with the aging process, but help it to its peak level. So when you speak about ingredients, I love that because there are many ingredients that can help us in this healthy aging process. And there are studies after studies that have shown these ingredients to work. 
the most common one and the most popular one I think everyone might be aware of is retinoic acid, retinol vitamin A. So we know it will make the cell turn over as efficient as it normally should. It will also boost collagen production. Then I even love niacinamide. We know it is a great anti-inflammatory agent. So it's not only going to take care of your cell turnover, but it's also going to take care of any sort of inflammation or pigmentation that is taking place within the skin. Then when it comes to um, aging, there are different aspects that we need to understand. We're talking about this pigmentation that occurs as well. So for that, maybe kojic acid or vitamin C. These are good ingredients to consider. So um, when you're talking about aging, what we generally can see visible over the skin will be wrinkles, pigmentation. So I think these ingredients will help at least take care of the basic level because topicals can only do so much, but they can do, at least they can give you a good start and a good foundation to work on. I, I love that you mentioned the ABCs. I, I, that's what I call them. Vitamin A, the retinoic acid, B, niacinamide, and C, vitamin C. I call those the ABCs of anti-aging. But at our company, we offer um, uh, we offer prescription-grade retinoic acid, right? Uh, tretinoin, as, as most people know it. Can you explain uh, just very briefly and quickly the difference between over-the-counter retinoids and prescription-grade retinoids? Yeah, so the over-the-counter retinoids that we get is basically retinols, and the other form that you might get now is retinal, retinal dehyde. So how the pro it starts, retinols are the weakest forms, if I might say, of uh, vitamin A, retinoic acid, and the prescription grade ones are the strongest forms. So based on the concentration, they are able to do different things to the skin. So um, for a beginner, if someone is completely new to it, I always ask them to start with go low and slow. That is the best thing to go when it comes to retinoic acid because uh, this is not a 100 meter sprint. This is a marathon that you're going in for and that you need to uh, make your skin condition too. So you start with retinols and you work your way up to a prescription grade retinoic acid or retinoin acid. But another thing is we know that the prescription grade retinoid, retinoic acid is not only for anti-aging. We use it for acne. We use it for so many other things. So it has its own, uh, because it comes with its own share of side effects as well that we need to take care of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so at Chiral, we compound the, the uh, tretinoin. We use a compounded version of it. So we're able to, through a quiz, we're able to gauge where the patient needs to be. And, you know, we mix it with other ingredients and make it for them. And we could, you know, slowly increase the dose, decrease. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's, would you say tretinoin is one of those ingredients? Just put it in your, as, in, as part of your skincare routine and, and because uh, my mom taught me that at a very young age, when I was 14, she was like, if you want healthy skin, just get yourself on tretinoin and stick with it. At the time it was what, uh, retin-A. She was like, just get the low dose retin-A and stick with it for the rest of your life and you won't have a single wrinkle. What about that as, as a myth? Is that true? I love it. And I think you have your mom to thank for if she really got you started on at such a young age, because um, like not everyone has that right kind of uh, counseling. Now, I wouldn't say you need to start that young, to be very honest, but um, it is something definitely if you want to maintain um, and keep up your healthy anti-aging game, you should incorporate definitely because studies after studies have proven without doubt that they have the capability to um, maintain your skin barrier and that collagen production that you need um, as you are aging. So I definitely think it is one of the things that you must incorporate if you are wishing to, like after your basic cleanse, moisturize and sunscreen, I think this is one of the things you should start if you're serious about keeping your skin healthy. And, and is it too late? So if you, the wrinkles are there, you're 60 years old and you, you know, sat in the sun and you have hyperpigmentation, you have wrinkles, would tretinoin still work for you and help 
rebuild the skin? So I say it's never too late. Like wherever you are now, you can always make progress from where you are. So whether you're young or you're old, definitely the kind of improvement that you're going to see is going to be different. I'm not going to uh, lie about that because the amount of sun damage that you've had when you're 16 compared to when you're 25 is going to be very different. So the kind of progress or uh, visible changes that you're going to see is going to be different as well, but it's never too late to begin. Mm. We heard it here from the doctor. Now, um, talking about sun damage, how does UV exposure contribute to skin aging and how can it be prevented? I know we talked about sunscreen, but can you talk to us about UV exposure? Sure. Um, so we have three kinds of UV radiations that we need to be aware about. We have UVA, we have UVB, and we have UVC. Now, we generally don't bother about UVC because it's blocked by the ozone layer. And now we know that the ozone layer is getting depleted at some places and we're worrying about that as well. But it's UVA and B that we know are notorious for causing DNA damage. They are capable of uh, stimulating the melanocytes. Those are the, uh, the birth cells for melanin, the pigment, the, the, the pigment forming cell. So um, they can lead to collagen breakdown. They can lead to uh, Many, we know it can cause cancer as well. So we know that ultraviolet radiation is notorious for causing a lot many things if you're going to be exposed to it for a long period of time. Mm, I love that. And can you explain the role of antioxidants and anti-aging? Sure. Um, specifically. So antioxidants, um, I, I prefer taking them in the form of oral in terms of your diet or supplements more than applying it over your skin. And the reason why I say this is what are antioxidants? They are something that are working against oxidation. So what basically is happening is there are certain like stressors, environmental pollutants that can cause um, free radical production, which can um, disturb the normal functioning of our skin that can damage collagen, that can damage the normal skin cycling. So these molecules, special molecules are going to come and protect us. Now, when it comes to topical formulations, it needs to be uh, in the form that can be absorbed, that is going to work in the right concentration at the right time to protect us. But what I always say that skin health is even, it's, it even plays a very important role in terms of what you consume from within, because ultimately our skin is being nourished from what we are consuming. So having antioxidants orally is equally important because I see many people focus on what to apply. Um, but that is another important aspect that I just wanted to bring to everyone's notice as well. I love that you bring that up. What are some foods that are high in antioxidants that you would recommend? Um, everything that is bright colored, like, like I always say, um, you don't need to like know because every country, every region has its specific uh, fruits and vegetables that are grown indigenously. So what is local is best for you. So I don't like naming any particular things, but I want you to be able to identify how they look. So anything with bright colors, all right? I, uh, it, like you might have heard, eat the rainbow because every pigment has its own form of uh, um, polyphenols has its own form of antioxidant, vitamin A, C, E that we know are the popular antioxidants. So having those will definitely help. Mm -hmm. So like tomatoes, no, guys, not this rainbow, okay? Eat the rainbow, but not this one. So like tomatoes, strawberries, blueberries, right? Those are, those are good examples of um, like the spectrum of antioxidants that we could eat through fruits, right? Right. Okay. All right. Um, now let's switch it up a little bit and talk about GLP ones. This uh, topic that a lot of our customers love to talk about. So um, many of our customers are using GLP one medications like semi-glutide and tirzepatide, and one of the side effects of taking these medications can be hair loss. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between weight loss and hair loss? Right, so um, uh, if I have to explain it in a very simple manner, 
I want you to think that your body considers your heart, liver, all these other organs as your vital organs, and rightfully so, because you can't survive without them, but you can survive without your hair. All right. So when you are um, on this path to weight loss, and especially if it is any form of rapid weight loss, or you're going to reduce your calorie intake, what your body is going to do is going to divert your nutrients to the vital organs and keep you alive rather than divert it to your skin and hair. And this is why this is such a common thing that we're seeing right now in office as well, like people who are on these medications and who are on diets leading to weight loss, having this form of hair shedding. We call this telogen effluvium, a kind of telogen effluvium that you might say, what is happening is basically your hair is not getting the adequate amount of nutrients that it needs to cycle and survive. And you are seeing this transition where it's losing uh, more hair than what you normally would. Okay. If that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So it's your body just sees that that process is not important because I have to deliver nutrients elsewhere. So what can you do ultimately to keep your hair? <laughs> Prevent it from falling off. Is it is it inevitable? Because what what do they say? Like twenty percent muscle loss and muscle atrophy is normal during any sort of weight loss. Is it the same when it comes to hair loss, where it's just inevitable? If you're losing weight, you're going to lose your hair. Or is there a way that you can prevent the hair loss while you lose the weight? So um, the kind of weight loss that you are achieving will determine that. So I have many people, um, what I always say is your goal should not be weight loss, to be very honest. It should be having healthy weight or having a healthy body because weight loss is a side effect that is going to happen when you're going to try to achieve that mindset and when you're going to try to achieve that kind of body, right? So um, now if you're on medications, if now we know semaglutide is a type 2 diabetes drug as well. So if you're having it for that, and you're experiencing this kind of side effect, you can definitely take care of it by taking care of your dietary and lifestyle factors because those are not going to help you um, only avert the hair loss side effect that is taking place, but even get you healthier as well. But if you're on a diet specifically that is restricting the number of calories that you're having, you need to work on it because um, I'm not a big propagator of any form of particular dietary restriction. I believe you are what you eat. You need to understand what type of body you have, what your roots are, what your body is used to having. And uh, like another thing that I always like focusing on is weight loss. What you see over the weighing scale is not a true measure because you could be losing weight um, and converting your fat into muscle, but um, still not losing weight over the weighing scale. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. So uh, weight loss is, again, such a broad uh, topic, but uh, I have seen and we have dealt with a lot of patients and clients and then explained to them this concept because I really believe in education is power. Like once you know what's happening, you can take an informed decision for yourself. So once you understand what's happening, you know for yourself what your body needs and what you need to keep everything working to its optimal state. So you need to make dietary and lifestyle changes to make sure that you are not only having a sustainable weight loss journey towards healthy, towards a healthy body, but you are also developing a metabolically active body that can sustain any form of changes and take care of it. So even if you see that weight loss transiently, your body will be able to take care of it and come back, come back and it bounce back. Now, will getting enough protein, right? Because I think adequate protein is very important during weight loss, at least. Um, would, would getting adequate protein help with the hair loss uh, side effects? Of course, yeah. Uh, the reason why I refrain from adding only protein is because then people only concentrate towards proteins. There are so many other micronutrients, vitamins and minerals that have a role to play. But as you correctly said, proteins is the major macronutrient out of the carbs, fats, and proteins that you need to concentrate on because our hair is made up of keratin and keratin is essentially a protein. So definitely, if you focus on having good quantities of good quality proteins, 
Um, I, I am a meat eater. I am a, I am a big proponent of having your egg and grass-fed meat and everything. But even vegans have their own share of like, tofu and beans and pulses. So um, you need to pay attention to what you are eating. But I always, again, it needs to be a balanced diet because not one particular thing is going to help. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, completely. Are there other foods um, that you can, uh, what, what is one? I know in our culture, they say, if you're pregnant, if you eat this, uh, your, your child will grow a head full of hair. I think it's a uh, fenugreen. I think it's a, it's a vegetable type, but are there other foods that you recommend as far as uh, nutrients go for hair growth? Yeah. Um, Nuts are, I'm a, nuts really help. I know what you were referring to, fenugreek. Yeah, that oh, is fenugreek. also, yeah, yeah, that, that works well as well. So is that true? It's not a myth? It's not a Persian myth? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, so it's not only going to help you with your hair, it's going to help with skin as well because it has so many other, it is a chock full of um, Everything, there are so many things present in fenugreek. So definitely, I'm not sure if it will come with a head full of hair. But it My will mom's really 2 and out right now. My mom's 2 and out. First with the tretinoin and the fenugreek. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. Anything else besides the fenugreek for, for hair, nutrients, and skin? Um, I am a big proponent of even um, fermented foods like yogurt. They really help because uh, the good bacteria are going to help metabolize whatever you eat and absorb it in, in a better form so that you get the nutrients throughout the body. Um, in terms of hair, um, I think uh, grass-fed meat, collagen, as I said, protein intake is one of the top highs that I have seen work very well if you're specifically focused towards skin and hair health. Mm. And let me ask you, I don't know if you've if you've heard of the term ozempic face, just to deviate quickly from, from hair, but I'm you know, talking about these uh, classes of drugs and GLP ones, but there's this term ozempic face. Um, can you explain and debunk that? Because I think people, you know, don't really understand it. Like you lose weight. Yeah, your skin starts to sag, but it's not because of the medications, correct? Can you explain what causes the ozempic face? So what's happening is essentially it is causing redistribution of the fat. So what is ozempic doing? What is semaglutide doing is it's increasing your insulin level. It is decreasing your appetite. It is causing, uh, uh, in, in that sense, it is redistributing your fat. And that is why you get those sunken cheeks and that hollow face and that appearance. But um, uh, again, I how many people are getting that kind of, Ozempic face that we have seen. We've seen so many people on the drug, but how many have we seen achieve that kind of face? Yeah, that's true. That's true. The media kind of blew it out of proportion. But is there anything besides fillers and Botox and you know those those sort of approaches? Is there anything you can do to avoid getting ozempic face or keep your 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 skin supple as you lose the weight? Is there is there um, anything you can do? Have healthy fats and proteins. Again, uh, you will always see me focus on I the eating it. aspect because um, that is what is actually nourishing our cells. So in the long run, um, it is going to... Um, another part of uh, another aspect that comes with aging is the bone loss that happens as well. So increasing your vitamin D, what we see is the bone, um, we see this entire uh, part sagging. So to keep that up, you need good amount of fats, vitamin D and proteins, because these three essential uh, components is what is making up everything, a majority of our skin cells and body. So yeah, like oh. if you'll always see having a, a person having a chubbier face, like inherently healthy, will look uh, prettier and more, uh, like you would want to see that face more than just a slim down face with like caloric deficient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a win lose. So you lose the weight here and you lose it here. And I wish there was a way to keep it in. I love that you bring up vitamin D. There's, I, by the way, I have these Skittles because I found it in my kid's uh, book bag and I took it away. So I, this is not for me. But um, I love, I keep this vitamin D complex on my desk just to make sure that I take it on a daily basis. And it has the vitamin D, A, E, 
and K1 and K2. Can you talk just quickly and briefly about vitamins and the role of these sort of vitamins, the D, A, Ks, uh, when it comes to healthy aging, especially when it comes to our skin and hair? Yeah, they are. Um, I love that you brought it up because they're one of the most important vitamins that, uh, uh, that again, you want to create a foundation uh, that you can build up on because these are the fat soluble vitamins that are. Uh, um, so, um, okay, the way I like explaining is our skin or our cells of the body uh, have an entire cell membrane that is made up of fats, right? And our hormones are fat soluble, are made up of fats. Our brain is 90% fat. So we don't realize the importance, but fats play a very important role. Another thing is fats don't make you fat. So when you speak about these vitamins, they are uh, playing a very important role in maintaining that integrity between the cells throughout the body. When it comes to any form of molecules, your hormones, your uh, all the kind of chemical processes, the digestive enzymes, all of these things need these vitamins and uh, in some form of the other. So if we are deficient in that, your body is not going to be optimally able to function. And that is why um, either getting it through food or if you feel your food is not adequate enough, supplementing it in the correct form. And quite honestly, today, however, we try to get the best organic produce, our soils are depleted. We know we are not getting the amount of nutrients that we need to. So I think you need to supplement in the right way, in the right form, and understand whether your body is reciprocating, needs it, and then accordingly balance it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sit in front of a window, but I'm indoors all day, most of the days. So I, I, you know, and I know vitamin D and all these vitamins play such a key role in longevity as well as mood and, and all aspects, like you said, of your life. So I make sure I keep mine on my desk so I, I don't forget to take it. Um, I want to shift gears and go back to hair loss just real quick. Um, so can we talk about, so we, we talked about hair loss when it comes to uh, our diet, we lose hair. How about during pregnancy? Is it the same type of hair loss that you experience during pregnancy, during uh, various phases in your life versus, can you just talk about hair loss very briefly if you can? So um, we essentially don't lose hair when we are pregnant. We will lose hair once we deliver right so because our hair goes into something known as the anagen arrest so the hair has a cycle as well of its own just like our skin does and uh, again during pregnancy what your body is trying to do is preserve everything for your baby so it's going to keep everything intact including the hair on your head and once uh, like you deliver it is such a strenuous again a stressful process for the body that uh, it again diverts all its essential uh, nutrients to producing milk for your baby to healing and recuperating from the labor and that's when the amount of nutrients that go up to your hair will to some extent decrease and what it was catching on and kept your hair in that prolonged growing phase is going to end and it's all going to like you'll see more amount of hair fall so this is something that we call telogen effluvium and that is true for any kind of stressful event. I'm not saying pregnancy is a kind of stress, but it is stressful. It's stressful. <laughs> Worst <laughs> trimester, it's stressful. <laughs> true, true. A mother's body goes through so much. I cannot yeah. deny that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So similarly, any form, a surgery is a form of stress. So you will always see telogen effluvium. That is this form of excessive hair shedding after any kind of stressful event, when the body needs to divert its energy more towards healing or another form, rather than divert its nutrients to, to hair. There are so many other forms of hair loss, like we know alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune condition. There is uh, age-related hair loss, which we know as androgenetic alopecia. So there are different kinds of hair loss, um, especially I've seen a lot of patients of mine come in with telogen effluvium that is stress related hair loss and that's when it unmasks their uh, age related hair loss like they start seeing hair loss from here and here and they're like I'm going bald and I'm like no this was always there and this was this has started happening it's just like since we are in this uh, transitional phase where your hair 
is trying to come back, the cycle is trying to come back. We've recognized this as well. And then we need to take care of both of them at the same time. No, I love that you bring up stress with hair loss. So how about graying of the hair? Like, I swear, I'm gray. I've been so stressed. I've caught a couple of gray hairs. What causes graying of the hair? So uh, graying, again, is part of the natural aging process. What is abnormal is if that graying is occurring prematurely. So uh, just like our skin ages, our hair ages, and the ability to produce that pigment in the hair decreases. So we know some people genetically, but it's very genetically determined. I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to lie about it. There's very little that we can do to control it. There are certain vitamin and mineral deficiencies too that can cause graying of hair, but whatever uh, people might advertise or say, there's very little we can do to actually stop the growing process until and unless you really biohack, like this biohacky movement, you actually biohack your body into aging slower than it normally does. And part of it would be reducing the amount of hair that you're growing as well. So the genetic uh, graying of hair, it doesn't necessarily mean that your body is in a stress stress state, correct? If you're genetically aging, it's not related, right? If um, it doesn't mean that you're physically aging, if your hair starts to gray in your early twenties, correct? Right, but um, um, like everything, uh, you cannot just pinpoint to one particular thing. It is multifactorial. So stress plays a very important role in premature graying as well. Um, if you see my husband, he had gray and white hair when he was 20. His all, like all his hair is white and gray. And he did go through a very stressful event mm -hmm. as part of his growing up years. So um, I'm not going to say that stress doesn't play a role. We've learned that. We know that we've seen that. But genetics, uh, the food you eat, all that plays a role as well. So we can never pinpoint to one thing. I will be wrong if I do so. But there are so many other variants that come into play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, just because I'm curious, and my brother brought this up, zinc and graying of the hair, is there is there a correlation between the two? There are many, many um, correlations that are always brought up. As I said, it's not one thing. There's mm -hmm. zinc, there's copper, there's chromium that they link to. So yeah, but... Um, like some minerals, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you. And lastly, for our listeners who want to achieve and maintain radiant skin and hair, do you have any tips or rules everyone should follow? Yeah, there are so many. Um, keep it simple. Get in tune with your body. Try to understand what is it trying to tell you? Because uh, that is one thing that I always tell my patients and clients is if you are seeing, you've come to me with a particular symptom or sign, it's your body's way of telling you something. So we need to understand what is it telling you, try to get to the root cause and treat it accordingly. And I'm a firm believer of you are what you eat and poop. So if you take care of your diet, take care of your lifestyle, be mindful of what you eat, the kind of people you are with, what you speak, how you feel, and ultimately, um, like you must have seen people who are in love we generally say they're glowing why are they doing so it's because they inherently are feeling getting those good hormones out so uh yeah be happy be healthy and uh, <laughs> that's all i love it it's good just holistically feel good and you'll start to glow on the outside i love it yes well Thank you so much, Dr. Doctor. Thank you so much for being our guest tonight and sharing all your insights and your wisdom. We loved having you. And thank you all for tuning in to another Thursday series, educational series here at Chiral. We'll see you all next week. Thank you again, Dr. Doctor. Have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.